But tonight we look at the first sign, Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Let us big, begin with definition. Dajjal is a being, a wujud. Dajjal was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created him in his wisdom. And when Allah created Dajjal, Allah endowed Dajjal with awesome power, with awesome versatility. And Dajjal was created at that time when Adam alayhi salam was created. Because the Prophet said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, every Prophet has warned his people about Dajjal. Every Prophet. So Dajjal has been created a long, 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 long time ago. In the last age, Dajjal will be released. <coughs> and when he is released on earth, Dajjal will have a general mission and he will have a specific mission. His general mission is to test all of mankind to test you to see whether you have any faith at all. All those who fail his test are heading for the fire. His test will be an awesomely difficult test. So great will be the test and trials to which mankind will be subjected by Dajjal. That the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the greatest fitna, fitna means a test and a trial, he said, the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam Alaihi Salam to the last day is the fitna of Dajjal. So don't play around with this subject. Be very serious with this subject. Dajjal will not only test all of mankind, and tonight we will look at some of the tests, but Dajjal has a specific mission. His mission is to impersonate Al-Masih and to get Banu Israel to believe that he is Al-Masih. And so in order to understand Dajjal in his capacity as Al-Masih al-Dajjal, we need first to understand who or what is Al-Masih. After Banu Israel had lived in the Holy Land, which Allah had given to them. And after Dawood alayhi salam had established the state of Israel, he was a Muslim, so this is the Islamic state of Israel. And after Suleiman alayhi salam had raised it until it became became the most magnificent state that history will ever witness. After Suleiman alayhi salam had built the masjid, and therefore after Banu Israel had experienced, take note of this, after Banu Israel had experienced the golden age, Then 
they committed misdeeds, they violated the trust with Allah, the covenant with Allah, they committed many, many sins, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled them from the Holy Land. Surah to Bani Israel of the Quran, Surah number 17, describes this. وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْقِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ يعني الأرض المقدسة لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعَلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا Twice did Banu Israel commit fasad in the Holy Land. Fasad is not just corruption. Fasad is a corruption which is destructive in nature. Hmm? What did they do? We don't have the time tonight. But if I get a chance to deliver the lecture Jerusalem in the Quran, then we can go into all those details. But they were expelled. It violated the conditions for residence in the Holy Land. And Allah sent a Babylonian army. And that Babylonian army destroyed the state of Israel, destroyed the masjid, and took Banu Israel into slavery in Babylon. Babylon is in today's modern day Iraq, in that territory. All right. And so the golden age has come to an end. While Banu Israel were there in Babylon, weeping, weeping by the rivers of Babylon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets to them. Among the prophets, was a prophet named Daniel, for example. And he's a very important figure, Daniel. When these prophets came to Banu Israel in Babylon, these prophets communicated to Banu Israel a promise from Allah to them. The promise was that he was going to send to them a prophet who would be a special prophet because this prophet would bring back the golden age. The golden age was one in which Suleiman alayhi salam and the state of Israel ruled the world. It was a ruling state of the world. And when this prophet comes, he will bring that back. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. This prophet, special prophet to Banu Israel, this prophet was known as Al-Masih. The meaning of the word is not relevant here. The significance of the word is what is relevant. The functions of Al-Masih is to bring back the golden age, to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order for the Messiah to bring back the golden age, the implication is, number one, this is clear as an implication, number one, he would first have to liberate the Holy Land from Gentile rule, non-Jewish rule. Number two, he would have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land. Number three, he would have to restore the state of Israel. And number four, that Israel must grow until it becomes the ruling state in the world and that Messiah must rule the world from Jerusalem. Only then will the golden age of Suleiman alayhi salam return.
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise and sent the Messiah, Al-Masih, in the person of Isa alayhi salam, they rejected him. Is it tomorrow night? No, Thursday night we have Islamic view of the return of Isa alayhi salam. Thursday night. So on Thursday night we're going to go into this in greater detail. Hmm? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise and sent the Messiah to them, they rejected him. Not all. No, no, no. There were some Jews who accepted him. But there are others who rejected him. They rejected him because they declared that he's a bastard. His mother gave birth to him without a father, without any, sorry, husband. And therefore she had committed that vile deed of zina. This is a bastard. A bastard cannot be <laughs> the Messiah. So they rejected him. And then later on, when they saw him die on the cross, before their very eyes they saw him die, it was now confirmed that although he himself claimed that he was the Messiah, and although there were many Jews who believed in him as the Messiah, the rabbis had rejected him, it was now confirmed he could not have been the Messiah. Why? Number one, he's dead. But the Holy Land has not been liberated. It is still under Roman rule. Number two, he's dead. But the state of Israel has not been restored. Number three, he's dead. But the state of Israel has not risen to become the ruling state in the world. And he has not ruled the world from Jerusalem. Huh? A number of reasons. So he could not have been the Messiah. Tomorrow night or Thursday night, I'll give you some more reasons. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. What they did not know, and you and I know, is that this was indeed Al-Masih. And when they thought that he was dead, that they had crucified him, no, he was not crucified. Allah made it appear unto them that he was crucified. And Allah raised him unto himself. So he did not experience something called mouth. Mouth. And since every soul must taste mouth, who said so? Every soul must taste mouth. Who said so? Yes, the Quran. Allah says so. Kullu nafsin za'ikatul mouth. Every soul must taste mouth. Therefore, he also must taste now. Therefore, he will return. He will die. Since they're still waiting for Al-Masih to come, you can't live in New York and not know that. Still, they're still waiting for Al-Masih to come. And they had boasted of how they killed this one. The Prophet Muhammad informed us that Allah will send in the last stage this being created by Allah who will impersonate Al-Masih and who will convince them that he is delivering the return of the golden age. He will deceive them, however, because he would not be the true Messiah. He will deceive them because this would not be the return of the golden age. It would appear like that. And so Dajjal has been endowed with awesome powers of deception. 
He has a PhD in deception. Dajjal. This is indeed the meaning of the word itself. Dajjal. If Dajjal is to deceive Banu Israel and get them to be convinced that he is the Messiah, look at what he will have to do. Number one, he will have to liberate the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule. Number two, he'll have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land. No matter how long they had lived outside of the Holy Land, he'll have to bring them back. Number three, he will have to restore the state of Israel. And number four, number four, he will have to take the state of Israel to that status where it will become the ruling state in the world. And he himself will then have to rule the world from Jerusalem. But said the Prophet to Islam, the Jal comes with two things. What are the two things? A handphone and a computer? Huh? Huh? The Jal comes with two things. He comes with, help me somebody. Help me somebody. Huh? No. He comes with two things. Come on somebody. Yes? Jannah and Jahannam, he comes with a river and a fire, says the Prophet He comes with a river and a fire, but his river is a fire, and his fire is the cool waters of a river. Whoever falls in his river will have his load of sin increased. And whoever falls in his fire would be relieved of his load of sins. Hmm? In other words, the age of the child will be an age in which appearance and reality would be completely different from each other. If judgment is based only on external observation, then judgment will be based on external appearance. But the internal reality is different. And so judgment would be wrong. And this is why Surah al kaf has given us the story of, come on somebody, of, of, yes, of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, because of a certain answer that he gave, we don't have the time to tell you the story now, he is now seeing with only his external sign. And on three occasions he formulates judgment based only on external On all three occasions he's wrong. He's wrong. His judgment is wrong. So even if you have a PhD from MIT, huh? if, your, if your judgment is based only on knowledge which is externally derived, then in the age of the Jal, you'll be wrong. You'll be deceived, because reality is the opposite of appearance. In order to be able to penetrate reality, and how great is Allah's wisdom now. Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah.
How great is he? How great is his wisdom? But in the last age, the only ones who will be able to penetrate external, of external appearance to reach to the reality of things, in consequence of which they will not be deceived. The only ones then will be those in whose heart there is faith. Maybe the bed is there, mashallah. Maybe the hat is there, mashallah. Maybe he's in the masjid five times a day, mashallah. But maybe nothing is in the heart. <laughs> nothing in the heart. So he can't see. But when the heart is turned to Allah, when the heart submits to Allah, when the heart says, I live for you, I'll die for you, then that heart, Allah will confer upon it nur. The Holy Land is not Makkah and Medina. Not in the Quran. The Holy Land is not Banaras. Not in the Quran. In the Quran, the Holy Land is that land in which the state of Israel is now located. Otherwise known as Palestine. The Holy Land. Strange events are unfolding in the Holy Land. This Quran has come to explain. And this Quran has come to guide. Guidance does not come from Islamic organizations or from the University of the West Indies or from Whitehall or from the Trinidad Guardian or the Express. Guidance comes from this book. That explanation and that guidance have come as rahma, an act of kindness from the Lord. And for those who have the good sense and the wisdom, and who make the effort to go into the book and study the book of Allah, and search for that which explains and that which guides, and then they accept and they embrace and they apply it in their lives. Bushra lahum. Good news and glad tidings for them. <coughs> they will understand what others cannot. They will succeed when others will not. The blessed Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam declared Every prophet warned his people about the Antichrist, about Dajjal, the false messiah. And the prophet Noah warned his people. But I, I say to you something that none have said before me. The Antichrist sees with one eye, his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes, on his forehead, is written the word kafir, disbeliever. And every mu'min will be able to read it. A mu'min is the one who has accepted the religion, the true religion but has not only accepted it with the lips, but the truth has entered into the heart. The one who has faith is a mu'min. 
And so every mu'min will be able to read and recognize disbeliever. Whether that mu'min is literate or illiterate. Well then why is it that the one who is a disbeliever cannot read? How come? The one who has faith can read. The one who has no faith cannot read. So maybe we should send him to the eye specialist to have his eyes examined. Why can't you read? But the report comes back from the eye specialist. Perfect vision. No glaucoma. No cataract. His eyes are perfect. Well then why can't he read? Even though his eyes are perfect. And why is it that the one who has faith can read and recognize kafir, disbeliever? Maybe that the one who has faith is not reading with these eyes. Do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? Do we have any other ears beside these ears? Do we have any other means of acquiring knowledge other than true sense perception and rationality, <coughs> true observation? The modern godless world says no. The Quran says yes. The Quran says that the heart can see. The Quran says that the heart can hear. When faith enters into the heart, then Allah puts noor in the heart, light. And with that light, the heart can see what these eyes cannot see. And so now it is plain and clear that when the one who has faith is seeing, he's seeing with more than these eyes, he's seeing with the heart. And so now it is also plain and clear that when the Dajjal sees with the left eye, it symbolizes external vision. When the jal is blind in the right eye, it symbolizes internal blindness. With this introduction, we understand now that when we're dealing with the subject of the Antichrist, there is a lot of symbolism involved in it religious symbolism which needs to be interpreted the messenger of allah nabi muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam informed us of the release of dajjal into the world during his lifetime he went on to say that when dajjal is released into the world he would live on earth for 40 days one day like a year one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of his days like your days. I got an artist in Malaysia to design this cover of the book. And you'll see that there are three circles. Over here, a day like a year. Over here, a day like a month. And over here, a day like a week. The analysis conducted in this book is such that it argues that when Dajjal was in a day which is like a year, Britain was his headquarters. And when Dajjal moved to a day which is like a month, the United States of America became his headquarters. And finally when Dajjal is going to be in a day which is like a week, 
He comes back home to the Holy Land. He comes back home to the Holy Land. The Jal has already completed his first phase, a day like a year, when Britain was the ruling state in the world and the sterling pound was the international currency. And then the Jal moved to a day which is like a month and the United States replaced Britain as the ruling state in the world. And the U.S. dollar became the international currency. And now the United States is about to relinquish power and Israel is about to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world. And what will be the new money? That was sterling pound. This was U.S. dollar. What will this be? Answer. The U.S. dollar is going to be attacked. It will collapse and bring down all the paper money of the world with it. You won't see paper money after that. Well, then what's going to be money? What's the new money that Israel will use to enslave mankind? The way the United States used the U.S. dollar. Answer? Israel is going to use invisible money. You can't see it. Intangible money. You can't touch it. It will be electronic money. And the strange thing, the dangerous thing about electronic money is it is controlled by the banking system around the world and the Jews control the banking system. That's not an uncharitable statement. That's not an invalid statement. That's the truth. That the Jews control the banking system around the world. And if we cannot speak the truth, what else is there to talk about? The new money is going to be invisible money. You can't see it. It's going to be intangible money. You can't touch it. It's no longer possible for you to conceal how much money you have. Your enemy will know exactly how much money you have. Even if you have it hidden underneath a pillow. Your enemy will not only know how much money you have, your enemy, your enemy will know how you are spending your money. And the minute the enemy gets the evidence that this is a man who is spending of his wealth in the way of Islam, they'll come after you. <laughs> they'll come after you to brand you a terrorist and to rip you off of whatever wealth you have. And so Dajjal, in a day which is like a week, a, a week now moves from the United States to Israel. And Israel becomes his headquarters. We said that Israel is about to wage a big war. They prepared for this when the Israeli Mossad and the CIA attacked America on September 11th and put the blame on us, us Muslims. They know that's false. They know that they're speaking a monstrous lie. But yet they do it. The Prophet ﷺ warned us that amongst the times of the last day, he said, would be that people would speak great lies. So beware, he said. Israel wages a big war. It takes control of the world. When Israel takes control of the world, Globalization brings the whole world together and Israel is able to control mankind. And then the Jal is going to be born into the world as a human being and eventually become the ruler of the world from Jerusalem, the way Mr. Bush is ruling the world from Washington today. And Mr. Churchill used to rule the world from London yesterday. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, we said, at that time, the Jal would have finished his mission and he would now declare, I am the Messiah. Now let's come to the first hadith. 
The very few I'm going to quote, but the very important. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, and it is perhaps the most important of the hadith I'm going to quote tonight. This one. He said, when the Jal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day, like a year. One day, like a month. One day, like a week. And the rest of his days, like your days. When his day is like our day, he will be in our dimension of time. But prior to that, he would not be in our dimension of time because his day would not be like our day. When he is in our dimension of time, at that time it will be possible for us to see him. At that time, he will appear as a human being. A human being, not a system, not a civilization, a human being. And he would be a Jew. And he would be a young man powerfully built, with curly hair. At that time, when he appears in the world, in our dimension of time, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu islam, he will come from the east. He pointed his finger 20 times to the east. The Jal will come from the east. But what about prior to that, when he will not be in our dimension of time. Where will he be, for example, when, when his day is like a year? Where will he be? Do we have any answer to that? He's going to be on earth, but we won't be able to see him. The angels, are they here in this room? Yes? How many? Each one of you have two angels on your forehead, on your shoulders. So there are many angels right here in this room. They are on earth. Are they in our dimension of time? No. No, no, no. So they don't perform salat according to our timetable. Huh? Fajr? For them is not fajr for us. Hmm? If we were to go into that day in which they live, and we have to perform salat, can we perform salat according to this timetable? No, we don't have to calculate to do it. Hmm? Can an angel come into our world? Can an angel come into our dimension of time so we can see the angel? Huh? Huh? Yes. Which one? Yes, Jibrail alayhi salam. Came as a human being. Right in the masjid. Are there jinn in this masjid now? Oh yes, they are. They are not. Can we see them? Are they in our dimension of time? No, they are not. But can they enter into our dimension of time? Yes. Mr. Shaitan himself, he believes. He came as a human being, as an old man, you remember, with a walking stick. So the Jal will enter into our dimension of time one day. We see him. But prior to that, in a day which is like a year, where will he be? It is from that location that he will commence his attack. He will begin his effort. Number one, 
to liberate the Holy Land. Number two, to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. Number three, to restore the state of Israel. Number four, you know what's number four. From that location, he will begin the, the, the effort. Where will it be? Fortunately for us, we have the answer. And it is also in Sahih Muslim. For us, we have the answer. And it is also in Sahih Muslim. It is known as the Hadith of Tamim al-Dari. Listen to it carefully now. Tamim al-Dari was a Christian who took the Shahada, became a Muslim in Medina. He came to the Prophet والسلام, and narrated an experience which he had. The Prophet والسلام, after the Salat in the Masjid asked the people, sit down, sit down. I have something to tell you. Tamim al-Dari has come to me and told me something about Dajjal which confirms what I have been saying to you. So we know that what is contained in this story is true. What did Tamim Uddari experience? He said that he and some 40 of his companions went on board a ship. So you need water. So they have to go in some place where you can travel with a ship, a sea or an ocean. And when they went on board the ship, a storm came. And the storm blew the ship for 40 days before, no, no, for a whole month, sorry, not 40 days. The storm blew the ship for a whole month before they reached land. Now, if you are on the western side of Arabia, which is Hijaz, and you get on board a ship, there are only two, two seas on which you can travel. One is the Mediterranean Sea and the other is the Red Sea. Only these two. But it seems very much unlikely, in fact impossible, for a ship to be in the Red Sea and for a storm to be blowing and that that ship did not touch land for a whole month because the Red Sea is very narrow. And so I have chosen to eliminate the Red Sea and I have chosen to remain with only the Mediterranean Sea. After they reached land, then they got off the ship onto a boat and they went and it was an island. And on the island they saw a strange beast. It was very hairy, so hairy, so much hair that you could hardly distinguish the head from the tail. So this beast is concealing its identity. And the beast spoke and said that I am, what? Huh? I am are you guessing now? I am Jassas. Jassas means a spy. A spy. So this is number one, an island about one month's journey from the western side of Arabia. Number two, this is an island which conceals its true identity. Number three, this is an island of those who have PhDs in spying, in espionage, huh? in intelligence work. Jesus then said to them, there is someone waiting to see you. Oh, 
over here at the monastery. Christian monastery. So this is a Christian island. When they went to the monastery, they found this young man, powerfully built, hmm, curly hair, but he was in chains. His hand chained to his neck, his legs chained. And this man started to question them, a number of questions. Uh, the Nabi al-Ummi, has he arrived in Medina? Nabi al-Ummi means, it doesn't, it doesn't mean the Nabi who cannot read and write. No. It means the Nabi who is not a Jew. The Nabi who is Gentile. Has he arrived in Medina? Yes, he has. Are the people accepting him? Some are accepting, some are not. This man then says, it will be to their benefit if they will follow him. A very important statement. Then he asks, the, the date plantations of a particular area, is the crop still coming out in abundance? They said, yes. He said, I don't think it will last for long. And then he asked, Buhayratu Tabariya, that's the Arabic name. The English name is the Sea of Galilee. The Jews call it Lake Kinneret. It is the largest sea in the Holy Land. It is from the Sea of Galilee that that whole of the Holy Land gets water. The Sea of Galilee. He said, is there any water in the Sea of Galilee? They said, yes, plenty water. He said, I don't think it's going to last for long. And then he said, I am the Jal. I am Dajjal. And when I am released, I'm going to enter every single town and city. But notice, he didn't say Kampung. <laughs> <laughs> he said, when I am released, I'm going to enter every town and city, except Makkah and Medina. Because the angels will bar me. Which means at the time when the Jal's day will be like our day, and he appears in the world as a human being, at that time he cannot enter Makkah and Medina, the angels will guard him. Now then, we now know from this hadith that when the Jal is released and commences his mission, he will commence his mission from this island. Which island is it? Which island is it? In 1917, the British Secretary of State was a man named Lord Balfour. And Lord Balfour made a declaration, a stunning declaration. Britain was the superpower in the world and Lord Balfour declared that the British government intends to pursue an effort for the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. In 1919, a British general led an army which defeated the Turkish army and from a Jewish perspective liberated Jerusalem and liberated the Holy Land. And then Britain became the power which controlled the Holy Land. The League of, in those days you didn't have the United Nations, you had the League of Nations. And the League of Nations conferred upon Britain something called mandate power. 
So Britain was the mandate power who controlled the Holy Land. Britain controlled the Holy Land from 1919 until 1948. In 1948, Britain acted as the midwife for the baby to be born. The baby, of course, was the state of Israel. In consequence of all of this, I have come to the conclusion that the island was Britain. And so when the Jal was released and commenced his mission to deceive Banu Israel and to deliver to them what would appear to be the return of the Golden Age, it is from Britain that he commenced his mission. But if there is anyone who differs with me, then I'll have to invite them to tell me, you tell me which island it is. You cannot just defer with me without telling me which island is it. Because the Hadith is there in Sahih Muslim. You've got to deal with the Hadith. During the time that Dajjal was launching his attack from Britain, the Holy Land was liberated of non-Jewish rule. During the time that Britain was hosting the Tsar, the Jews came back to the Holy Land. And during the time that the Tsar was launching his attack from Britain, the state of Israel was restored. Three out of four already delivered. And in all of this, the overwhelming majority of Jews have been absolutely convinced that all of this represent blessings from Allah. That Allah is validating the Jewish claim to truth. That Allah is fulfilling His promise to Banu Israel. Now comes a little more difficult part. It was fairly simple to identify the island of Britain. If when the Jal was in a day which lasts like a year, he will be in an island, according to the Hadith of Tamim Dari. Where will he be in a day which is like a month? Is he going to move to another territory? And if he moves to another territory, how can we recognize it? The yardstick which I use to measure whether or not the Jal has moved to another territory in a day which is like a month is the yardstick of the state of Israel. Who is the one who is keeping it alive? Who is the one who is conferring upon it security? Who is the one who is building it up constantly? feeding it, feeding it, and making it stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Is it Britain? The answer is no. Remember, your brother Imran is also a student of international relations. Don't forget that. The answer is no. Someone else has taken over from Britain as the strategic ally of the state of Israel. 
Britain is still there. But now there's someone else more important than Britain with a more strategic relationship. The United States of America is without any question whatsoever the most important strategic ally of the State of Israel in the world today. Without any question whatsoever. The United States of America is the country which is supporting Israel with the greatest amount of financial assistance and material assistance. The United States of America is the country which has a strategic military alliance with the State of Israel. And so, I have come to the conclusion that the jar in a day which is like a month is no longer in Britain. Britain now has to give way to another country. Britain was the superpower. Britain was ruling the world. But now another country mysteriously, strangely, inexplicably takes over from Britain as the ruling power in the world and the strategic ally of the State of Israel. This is the United States of America. This is the United States of America. When did it happen? Now we're going to test your knowledge of international affairs. When did it happen? I think you would agree with me, number one, that the Second World War would be the turning point, clearly. Because in the Second World War, all the Allied troops on the continent of Europe, which were fighting Hitler, were under one command. Was it a British general? Huh? No. Who is it? General? Eisenhower. An American general. And so here is tangible evidence that the United States has now taken over from Britain as a senior partner. Evidence number two. At the end of the Second World War, in 1945, the, the international community came together in a conference in Bretton Woods in upstate New York to create a new international monetary system. Prior to this, Britain, London, was the financial capital of the world. Ever since the Bank of England was established maybe 200 years earlier, London was the financial capital of the world. And the ruling currency in the world was the British sterling pound. His Majesty the sterling pound. But now at Bretton Woods, something strange happens. The Bretton Woods Agreement confers upon the U.S. dollar the status of the ruling currency. And the Bretton Woods Agreement confers upon Washington the status of the financial capital of the world because the International Monetary Fund is now located in Washington. The British didn't like that at all. The World Bank is located in Washington. The British didn't like that at all. So here is the second tangible evidence that Britain has now conceded and the United States has now taken over as the ruling power in the world.
And then came a third and even more dramatic evidence. In 1952, a revolution took place in Egypt. And the Egyptian king, Farouk, was overthrown by the military. The military put General Muhammad Nagib, or Najib, as the president. But he was like a figurehead, really, because there were a group of officers who really controlled the thing. Muhammad Nagib remained as the president from 1952 until 1956. But in 1955, there was a very important conference of Asian and African states which took place in a city in Indonesia. Which one? Bandung. I was in Bandung two weeks ago. Bandung, water in Ka Bandung, very cold. When you take your bath in the morning, very cold water. At the Bandung conference, it is not Muhammad Nagib who goes to represent Egypt but rather a man named Gamal Abdel Nasser. That's a sign of who is in charge. The next year, 1956, Gamal Abdel Nasser replaces Muhammad Nagib as the president of Egypt. Shortly after that, same 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal. Who built the Suez Canal? The French. Ferdinand de Lesseps was the French engineer. And then the French and the British came together in a joint control of the Suez Canal. Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal removes the French and British troops which were there, and Egyptian troops now take control of the Suez Canal. This is as plain and as clear an act of defiance and of confrontation with Britain as you could possibly find. In order for Britain to have any vestige of a claim to be a superpower, Britain has to respond, must respond. Well, what Britain did was, strangely, mysteriously, Britain kept the United States out. And the British and the French joined with Israel and these three countries invaded Egypt. They landed in Suez and they took control of Suez. And the Israeli army swept through the Sinai Peninsula and took control of the whole of Sinai. And the Israeli army reached to the Suez Canal. General Dwight Eisenhower said, no, I will not allow this. Go back. Can you tell Britain that? Withdraw your troops. Go back. Will Britain obey? Sir Anthony Eden was the British Prime Minister. Guess what Britain had to do? Huh? Britain had to withdraw its troops. And France had to withdraw its troops. And the state of Israel had to withdraw its troops back to Israel. Because the American president said, no, I will not permit it. Go back. So here you have the third, the most dramatic of all evidence that the United States of America has now taken over from Britain as the ruling power in the world. 
And that the United States of America still has this strategic relationship with the State of Israel. I have taken pains to mention dates because I want you to calculate. That was a day like a year and this is a day like a month. What comes after this? Now is the time you have to think. And if out there in Indonesia they could understand it so easily and so quickly, grasp it so quickly, there is no reason why you cannot. In order for Dajjal to complete his mission, he has to move from a day which is like a month to a day which is like a week. If when he was in a day like a year, he was in one territory, and that was the ruling territory, the ruling power, and then in a day which is like a month, he moved to another territory, and that country became the ruling power, it follows therefrom that when he moves to a day which is like a week, he will move to a third place, a third country. And that country will now replace the United States of America as the ruling power in the world. But it will not rule for long. Just a short time. Which will be that territory? Which will be that territory? China? Ready? You think so? Anybody else? Israel. Israel, of course. Of course, Israel. The state of Israel has enough nuclear weapons, enough thermonuclear weapons to lay claim to be a superpower. Already. But in order to be recognized as a ruling power in the world, Israel will have to give a spectacular display, a spectacular display, a dazzling display of its military might, which is not, it has never done so far. All that the world has seen is glimpses of what Israel is capable of doing. But it will have to be a spectacular display of its military power. When it does so, it will have to emerge out of that military uh, event. It will have to emerge as the dominant power in that region. So that all the states in the region in which Israel is located must all submit to Israel. Secondly, when Britain was the ruling power, London was the financial capital of the world. When the United States became the ruling power, Washington was the financial capital of the world, ably assisted by New York. And so if Israel is to become the ruling power in the world, something dramatic has to happen in the monetary system around the world in the financial system around the world. Something dramatic has to happen. In consequence of which, the financial capital of the world will now shift to Jerusalem or to the Jews. What is it that can happen? Oh, I love the Indonesians. Because they could understand so quickly, so easily, I don't know, maybe because they eat a lot of nasi <laughs> rice. <laughs> the answer is the international monetary system is based on fraud, paper money. If I get a chance, I can teach you the subject, but tonight is not the night. But it is fraudulent. The entire world of money is connected to one currency, 
the U.S. dollar. The Indonesian rupiah can fall and it will cause ripple effect on neighboring countries and so on, but it wouldn't bring down the world. The Turkish lira could be ready for Salatul Janazah, which is almost what is happening now. Turkish, Turkish lira. But it would not bring down the world of paper money. But if the US dollar collapses, then it will bring down the entire system. Can the US dollar collapse? Yes. Is it vulnerable? This is my subject. International monetary economics. This is my subject. The answer is yes, but I don't have the time to give you the details. I don't have the time tonight. Something is going to happen which will bring the US dollar crashing down. You don't believe me. If you don't believe me, when it happens, then you will have to believe me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you will have to believe me on that day. But then you would look like a donkey. Yes. All those who have stayed confident that there is integrity in this monetary system. And this money is strong, it will never fall. And Imran is just talking nonsense. On that day, they will look like donkeys when the whole system crashes. Our prophet has prophesied it. It's there in the hadith. He said the day will come when nothing will be of value, meaning as money, except a dinar and a dirham. And a dinar is not made of paper. <laughs> a dinar made of gold. The dirham is made of silver. The, the sunnah, the sunnah of Muhammad is dinar and dirham. The sunnah of all the prophets of Allah, the sunnah is dinar and dirham, gold and silver coins. We have abandoned the sunnah. We have abandoned Muhammad alayhi wasalam, and we're paying the price for it. The international financial system around the world today is in the control of Jewish bankers and Jewish financiers. If they want to, they can bring the US dollar down today. They can do it. Because Washington has printed too much paper. And there are far more US dollars outside of the United States than there are in the United States. It's entirely fraudulent. If I were to do it, they'd put me in jail. <laughs> and so two things will have to happen. The financial system will have to collapse. And after that, the Jews will control the finances of the world. And number two, there'll have to be this spectacular display of military power. But when that military attack takes place, Israel will have to be able to argue, we were provoked. We we're only trying to defend ourselves. So in order to do this, you have to begin the process with Ariel Sharon going into Masjid Al-Aqsa with 1,000 Israeli soldiers in a deliberate act of provocation. He knows what the Palestinians are going to do when he does this. A deliberate act of provocation intended to bring that intifada back to life. And when it comes to life, and the killing starts, Israel will have to talk peace on this side, but continue doing pinpoint killings. Huh? 
Every time they kill, every time they assassinate, it is intended to further inflame the passions of the Palestinian people, bring that state of rage. And as the oppression continues to increase, there is going to be an awakening amongst the Arab masses. Egyptian people are going to be very angry. Jordanian people are going to be very angry. So what is the king of Jordan going to do? What is Mubarak going to do? What is the Saudi government going to do? In order to survive, when your people are becoming more and more angry, you're going to have to start making some powerful statements. You see? Like, king, like Abdullah just did last week from Saudi Arabia. And Mubarak will now have to speak very hostile against Israel. And perhaps one day even King Abdullah of Jordan will have to start to do the same thing. So as these statements now come out, and maybe you have an Arab summit conference and so, and the impression is created that the Arabs are closing in now on Israel, the stage is set. Perfectly. And now Israel can launch that spectacular military attack. The Israeli people are calling on the government, come on, come on, what are you waiting on? Let's wage war. In the Israeli cabinet they're calling for it. Hmm? And the government is giving the impression to the world that we are restraining ourselves. We are restraining ourselves. How long will it be before that takes place? I don't think long. That spectacular military display is coming soon. It is my impression that when that happens, it will be the most appropriate time to bring down the international monetary system, which is already fraudulent and already vulnerable. And therefore, that will be a time when the Dajjal will move from a day which is a month to a day which is like a week. Israel now emerges as the ruling power in the world. The impression is created that this is the return of the golden age. It is only at that time that Dajjal will now appear in a day which is like our day. I assume that he will be the ruler of Israel. And so from Jerusalem he rules the world. And so he's accomplished his mission. And the golden age has come back. But Banu Israel will not be able to recognize that they were deceived. It is after this that Imam al-Mahdi emerges. I have this lecture maybe tomorrow. But Imam al-Mahdi will not emerge until the water in the Sea of Galilee is dry. When Imam al-Mahdi emerges, it is that time that Isa al-Islam will return. And he will kill Dajjal. But Isa al-Islam cannot return until the water in the Sea of Galilee is dry. How low is the water? Is it drying up? I read the Jerusalem Post every day on the internet in order to monitor the water level in the Sea of Galilee. It is now so low, as never before in history, so low, that Israel itself has declared, that is the water engineers, that they expect sometime this summer that the water level will be so low that the Sea of Galilee can never be restored going to die now. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. What's the end going to be like? The Prophet said, Islam, that even if it was the last day, Allah would lengthen that day so that a man from my family whose name is my name, whose grandfather's name is my, whose father's name is my father's name. Namely, his name will be Abdullah. Uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That man will arise 
and proclaim himself to be Imam al Mahdi. That's what the Prophet said. When the Jal announces that he is the Messiah and deceives many amongst mankind, that would be the time that the Imam will also be born and the Imam will grow up to be a man. And he will be a well-known Muslim. Because the Prophet said, a Muslim ruler will die. And then there would be arguments and disagreements concerning succession. And at that time a man will come out of Medina and hurry to Makkah. When he reaches to Makkah, the people will come out to him and force him to accept the bayah. The Bayah is a political institution which is used to legitimize power and rule over Muslims. When the people take the Bayah, he will then proclaim and say, I am the Mahdi. I am the Mahdi. When he makes that proclamation, said the Prophet, والسلام, an army will come to attack him. The army will come from the north, from Syria. The earth will open and swallow the army when the army is between Mecca and Medina. Between Medina and Mecca. And when the army swallows, that will be sign number eight. Three major earthquakes. In fact, I believe that the recent tsunami in Southeast Asia is the first of the three earthquakes. The second one should happen in the West. And then the third one will happen in Arabia. After that, the Dajjal will now attack the Imam. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ from the East. When the confrontation between the Dajjal and the Imam takes place, it will be in Damascus. Then, said the Prophet ﷺ, Nabi Isa ﷺ will come down from the sky with his hand resting on the wings of two angels in a day which is like our day and at that time will the true Messiah come down. When he comes down, he'll kill that false Messiah. And after that false Messiah is killed, then Allah will destroy Gog and Magog. And now, it's a level battlefield because the cruise missiles ain't going to work anymore. All the electronic gadgetry will not work anymore once the Dajjal is destroyed. And so it's back to conventional warfare. Oh yes, with horses. The Prophet said, when that happens, he said, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, go and join that army. if you have to. Huh? Crawl over ice. Go and join that army even if you have to leave Singapore. Go and join that army. Because Allah's Khalifa, Imam al Mahdi, is in that army. And no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so now, we don't have time to debate this subject with those who differ with us. We don't have time for them anymore. <laughs> they can differ with us. They can disbelieve all of this. It doesn't bother us. Because we know the countdown has begun. We know it's just a little bit more time. When a Muslim army will destroy the state of Israel, the Holy Land will then be liberated. The true followers of Ibrahim alayhi salam will then take control of the Holy Land. The state of Israel of Suleiman alayhi salam will be restored by Isa alayhi salam. And the Prophet said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said that Jesus will rule as a just 
Hakim Adil, a just ruler from Jerusalem. And so the prophecy will be fulfilled. And the golden age will be restored. But it is the followers of Muhammad والسلام, which would have inherited the legacy of Suleiman. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كفين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا فلعلك باخع نفسك على آثارهم إن لم يؤمنوا بهذا الحديث أسفا إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا وإنا لجاعلون ما عليها صعيدا جرزا أم حسبت أن أصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من آياتنا عجبا إذ أوى الفتية إلى الكهف فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا 